Love it. Hey, welcome friends of the room, friends of Fort Worth, Houston, El Paso, Rogers, Arkansas, Phoenix, wherever you're joining us from, we're so glad that you're here, and especially uh, friends here, we're glad that you are here. Tonight, we have got a treat. Uh, a friend of ours, a young adult pastor in town named Trip Lee is joining us. We're going to take a departure, and he is from Concord Church, a church that we love dearly. So will you guys put your hands together for Trip, who's coming to teach us from God's Word? How's everybody doing? Good. Excited to be here with you tonight. Um, I just want to shout out real quick. My wife is here. Y'all say hi, Jess. And we also got some folks from Concord, some of our young adult leaders who are here hanging out in the front. Y'all just make some noise for them real quick, hanging with us. Excited to be here with y'all. One of the ways that we know there may be some cultural difference between the churches is that when the sports activities were listed, it was like soccer and softball <laughs> and uh, ultimate frisbee <laughs> and spike ball. What is spike ball? I've never even heard of that. There are whole sports that y'all are keeping from black people. All right. First, ours would have been like basketball, three-on-three -three basketball, <laughs> knockout, you know, those kinds of basketball-related things. Again, I'm excited to be here with y'all tonight and to preach God's Word. I'm grateful for Watermark, grateful for the porch, uh, love what y'all are doing, and excited to serve you. So I, I want to pray one more time, and, and we'll dive right in. Father, we thank you so much for your Word. God, thank you for everybody who's here tonight, Lord. Thank you for bringing them. God, we know that you love them, you care for them, Father. So we pray this will be a good use of our time. We pray you would speak through your word, Father. We pray you would um, yeah, unearth the stuff in our life that doesn't look like you. God, I pray for my friends who don't know you. Help them to see you, God. I pray for my friends who know you. Help them to see you more. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, well, David just gave me a I just told you real quick who I am, just to tell you a little bit more so you know who you're listening to. I'm from Dallas, uh, grew up here, uh, lived a couple other places before I just came back, uh, but God has been really gracious. And when I was uh, really young, when I was maybe about f uh, 14 years old, um, the Lord took someone like me who I had assumed because I grew up in Dallas, which as you know, is a really churchy place, and I grew up just assuming that I was a Christian. Just because I went to church with my family and I had repeated a prayer after a children's pastor, and that made me think uh, that I was a Christian. Um, and so I assumed it for a long time. And then, fast forward, you know, I had uh, gotten uh, drugged to church by my parents when I was 13 or 14. And, you know, there was a sign up for the, like a summer retreat for the youth. And I was like, I'm not trying to sign up for that. And then I seen some cute girls in line. I was like, I'm going to go sign up for that. And I did. <laughs> really bad reasons, uh, but the Lord had better ones because the, the youth pastor at Concord, Concord is a church where I met Jesus, uh, the youth pastor was a good youth pastor, meaning we did more than just have fun. He also opened the Bible and preached the gospel of Jesus. And as he opened the Bible and preached the gospel, uh, the stuff that I hadn't understood that, that I assumed uh, about myself being a Christian before, about who God was, who I was, what Jesus did, the Lord made that stuff clear to me. And so since then, the Lord has given me the opportunity to be able to um, yeah, do what my heart beats for, which is I want to help people see the same Jesus that I've been shown. And so I'm praying we have the opportunity to do that tonight. I've tried to do that in a lot of ways with, with music and, and with preaching God's Word, and I'm excited to, to do that tonight. What I want to talk about tonight uh, is the state of your faith. I want to talk to you about the state of your faith, and, and it'll become clear what I mean by that. Um, one of the problems uh, with talking about something like this, uh, one of the problems with how we think about our faith is this, uh, is that those who call themselves Christians, we sometimes see our faith as a finished product instead of a work in progress. We think about our faith, we just think of it as a finished product instead of a work in progress, and when we are confused about what stage we're in, everything is thrown off, and this is in every area of our life. Um, so we're all familiar with the with the phrase that kids will say on a long trip. What, what is that phrase? Are we there yet? You know, before I had kids, I thought that this was fake. 
I thought this was like a funny thing in movies. And if you don't have kids, I just want to let you know, this is real. The kids actually say this, and they say it so often that you really want to be like, if you want to be there, you can just get out right now, and we can just <laughs> keep going where we're going. Um, but kids ask that over and over again. But it's not just kids. We, we all do this, too, in different ways. Just think about when you're on a trip somewhere, even if you know. So, like, you know, we're on the way from, uh, uh, from, from Dallas up, up here, um, and, and we're looking at our phones. And as we drive, even if you know how long it's going to take, you keep looking. Even if you know you got a good 45 minutes left, you're still looking like, Where, how, how long we got left? just hoping that it gets there a little bit closer. You know, some of us, while we're at school or at work, we spend more time looking at the clock than we do our actual work, just hoping that somehow we can will time to go a lot faster. We're constantly asking this question, are we there yet? And, and here's what happens. Once we assume that we've arrived, what do we do? We relax. You're happy when you make it to your destination. So it's a good thing. The, the only problem comes in is when you think you've already made it to your destination, but you're still on the way because then you've relaxed way too early when you think the task is over. So here's what happens. When we assume that our faith is just this one-time event that gets us entry into the kingdom, when we assume that with our faith we've already arrived, that's a problem because I think what Scripture shows is just because we believed doesn't mean we've arrived. If you walk away with one thing today, I want it to be that. Just because you've believed in Jesus does not mean you've arrived because when we treat our faith like a finished product instead of a work in progress, it will get neglected. It means we will relax too early because we think we will have arrived. So, so what I want to do is I want to look at uh, just two points in a particular text. If you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, that should be on the screen. And I'll, I'll read. In this text, Paul is writing to some Christians in Thessalonica. And, and here, here's what he says to them. He says, so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who's our brother and co-worker in God's service and spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined with them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we'd be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. We'll stop there. We'll, we'll read a little bit more as we go. But I, but I want to look at this passage in, in two points to, uh, to, to remind us that just because we believe doesn't mean we've arrived. And the first one is this. Your faith needs work. So I don't assume that everybody in this room is a believer in Jesus. But for those of us who are, I, I, I don't want you to think that because you're a believer, you've arrived at the end destination. So, so the first one is this. Your faith needs work. Here's what I don't mean. I don't mean that Jesus will not save you until you do a bunch of good works. What we know about Jesus is uh, Jesus is perfectly capable of saving us on his own. And what Jesus did on the cross is he, he purchased our salvation. So I'm not saying for Jesus to save you, you have to add some stuff to what he's already done. But I am saying this. Faith is not a one-time event that we look back on. Faith is a lifestyle. F faith is a lens that we see everything else through. Faith is fuel uh, for every good work that we do. And, and so I want to ask you how you would respond. And if I was to ask you just a simple question, how's your faith? Just think about that for a second. How would you respond if I asked you, how's your faith? And when I ask you that, do you just think about uh, some one-time event that happened a long time ago when you walk down an aisle or you repeated a prayer like I did when I was a kid? And I hope not. Uh, because as Paul writes to these Christians in, in Thessalonica, he's writing to these folks who he went there and he preached the gospel, right? And, and Jesus saved some people. And, and what happens is people get mad at Paul for preaching the gospel. So he ends up getting pushed out and Paul writes back to them, right? Uh, and, and he sends Timothy to go check on them, right? So this is why he says in verse 1, we could stand it no longer. We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy who's our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. Paul sends Timothy almost like a doctor making a house call to check on their spiritual health. 
to give them a little bit of a dose of what they need to continue to grow in health. But the fact that Timothy was sent to check on their faith should tell us something about what faith is like, that faith is something that needs to be sustained and checked in on. So I know y'all are in this series talking about self-care. Well, well, Paul wants the Thessalonians to understand that even though you've believed in Jesus, there's still some care that needs to happen, right? You're not at the end yet. Um, So why does Paul think that the Thessalonians' faith would need to be checked in on? There's something specific about the Thessalonians. Well, what Paul understands about them is that their faith is fragile, that they are fragile. And the same thing is true about us, that we are fragile. I wonder if you ever think of yourself as fragile. That's not a way we like to think of ourselves. We like to think of ourselves as strong, especially dudes in here. We don't like anybody to see any weakness ever. That's why half of y'all get hurt every time you go to the gym. You just trying to lift all kind of weight. You know, you, like, you have never lifted this before, bro. Why do you think? Just praying before, like, the Lord is, is the Lord wants you to stop being a fool. That's what he would like. <laughs> That's what you need power for. We don't like to think of ourselves as fragile. We like to think of ourselves as strong, and our pride blinds us to this. But there's a reason why when people uh, trust Jesus, the Bible uses the language of new birth. Right? Because when a new child is born, they're fragile. Uh, My sister had a a baby recently, and I was just reminded that babies are so fragile. And, you know, not to be rude to babies, but they can't do nothing. (laughs) I mean, they can't do anything. Um, You know, like my niece, she can't even hold her head up. It's like if there's one baseline of something you can do for yourself, just keep your head up. And she can't even do that. And there's nothing wrong with her. She's just fragile. But this is the kind of language the Bible uses of those of us who've just started to follow Jesus, is we're babies. We're fragile. We need to be cared for. And it's not that the life hasn't really begun. It's that that life needs to be cared for in order to be uh, sustained. It needs to be looked after. And there are all kinds of strength that's, been, uh, that's needed to build that up. So let me give you another example. My, my wife is here tonight, and she's great at many things. And she has given me uh, permission to say this. But my wife is great at so many things. There are, I mean, I could give you a long list. One of the things that she's not good at is keeping plants alive. <laughs> my wife, she, you know, she loves plants. I'm of the belief that plants are outside for a reason. That's where they should stay in the ground outside. My wife loves to have plants on the inside of our house. Um, but what happens is they always die terrible, painful deaths. Um, and so she always kills them. And you know how the Bible says, like, you say you love your brother, but do you really? That's how I feel about her and plants. I'm like, you say you love them, but do you? Because she's a serial plant killer. And because of that, um, I felt like I had to put my foot down and be like, I don't think we can have plants in our house anymore um, because it's unjust. And though the exception I made was this, if those plants are fake, because here's the great thing about fake plants is that they're fake, and you don't have to pay attention to them. You can't kill a fake plant. You don't have to water it. You don't have to put it in front of the sun. You can forget that the plant exists for four years and come back, and the plant looks exactly the same. Fake plants are wonderful in that way. And, and here's, here's what happens. is sometimes we treat our faith like it's that fake plant, like it's something that exists that we can forget about entirely, that we don't have to water, that we don't have to put in front of the sun, that doesn't need anything to thrive and grow or flourish. And we expect to show up and for it to be in exactly the same state, but that's not true. Our faith is more like a real living plant that needs stuff in order to grow, that needs things in order to thrive and to flourish And what Paul is saying is, I've sent Timothy to check up on you because there are things that need to happen if your faith is going to survive. Timothy's checking in on them to see how they're doing. Because believing in Jesus doesn't mean that you've arrived. And so Paul understands that there are dangers in our world that are a threat to our faith. One to attack. And and Paul talks about two threats in in verse 3. He says he doesn't want anyone to be unsettled by these trials. In verse 5, he says, I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you. Our faith is under attack by temptation, pushback from, uh, from the world and from the devil. So, so this is what's part of what is important about not seeing our faith as a finished product is not ignoring the threats. And so I, I want to talk about those two threats he talks about. One of them is, is trials. 
This is one of the things that's a threat to our faith. Uh, he's talking mainly about affliction that comes from, from persecution, people opposing them because they follow Jesus. Because remember, Paul got pushed out of this place for preaching Jesus, and they were persecuted in, in ways much harder than we are today. Um, but even so, that pushback can make us want to leave Jesus. Right, because people do push back when you are serious about Jesus. I remember when I first started following Jesus in high school, there was a lot of people who, um, they were cool with me liking Jesus as long as I didn't like him enough to actually do what he said. When I began to try to do what Jesus said, that's when people were like, Trip, what are you doing, bro? You're doing too much. You're extra. I'm a Christian too. Why are you out here trying to be a super Christian? but I thought I was just doing what Jesus called me to do. He, he's saying these trials, this pushback, and, and the reason that that's a threat to our faith is because it's human instinct to always want to lead towards whatever seems easier to us, right? When, when if you touch the stove and it hurts you, try not to touch the stove again. And in the same way, there's something in our minds and hearts that says, if I said that and I got this kind of pushback, I just won't say that anymore. So Paul is saying that could tempt us to walk away from Jesus. But avoiding trials and avoiding pain is not worth that. The other kind of trials, too, besides persecution that, that can threaten our faith, losing a loved one, losing a job, mental illness, disease, being broke, being lonely, right? That kind of stuff, those kind of trials can shake us if we're not careful. Not only trials, but also the tempter. He talks about the tempter, Satan. Satan can also tempt us away. Satan can make all kind of stuff seem more appealing to us than Jesus. He'll throw sin at us. He'll throw doubts at us. And Satan, you know, he has authority in this world. I don't know if we recognize this. Satan is a master of false advertising. He knows how to make stuff look better than Jesus. This is why Paul is saying this is danger for the tempter. You ever seen like a, a commercial for some food on, on TV? And then when you see it in person, you're like, that is not what y'all said. Every time I see Wendy's with them pictures of them perfectly square burger patties, I'm like, now y'all know them patties don't look like that. Them mothers never square. They look real jagged. <laughs> or, you know, one time me and my wife was watching TV, and they were Taco Bell. Was it Taco Bell? It's probably good that I don't remember where it was from. Um, but they were advertising Mac and Cheetos. Ew, that's right. Whoever said that? <laughs> Ew, that's not how I would have said it, but it's true. Mac and Cheetos, which sounds disgusting, but they were trying to make it seem like it was revolutionary and amazing. And this is what Satan does, is he will all the time, <laughs> Satan came up with Mac and Cheetos, this plan. <laughs> no, nah, but, nah, but, but this is what Satan does, though, is, is he will take something that's not good, that's not good for your soul, that's not good for the people around you, and he will try to sell it to us like it's good. This is what he does. And convince us that it won't uh, make shipwreck of our life and our faith. And Paul is saying, look, I'm sending Timothy to check on y'all. Our prayer is that trials and temptation won't have pushed you away from Jesus. And, and I'll say this, um, that whenever I've talked to people who, who don't want to follow Jesus anymore, it's always because of one of these two dangers, because of some kind of pain or some kind of sin. That we're hurt by something uh, or hurt by somebody that makes us reassess what we think about Jesus. Or some kind of sin draws us away and it makes us reassess what we think about Jesus. And we are vulnerable in those moments. So if you are in a season of trial or a season of temptation, I want to ask you to guard yourself, to watch out for these dangers. I want to encourage you to watch out for each other. Right? If, if you know a friend who, who's in a season of, of a lot of trial or temptation, I want to encourage you to watch out for each other because when we understand we're under attack, it changes our posture. It changes our posture because um, all, most of the time we don't live like our faith is actually under attack. We casually stroll when we should be treading carefully. Right? When you know your faith is under attack, you're careful. When you think everything is good, you're careless. And too many of us are careless with our faith. We, we don't think about the fact that it's under attack. My, my son, one time, he, uh, he, he, he started having some cold sores. He was, he was like six months old, so we didn't think it was a big deal. Uh, but what happened was it got infected, and he ended up in the hospital, and he was in the emergency room. And so when we realized, oh, this is more than just cold sores, our whole posture changed. It went from just being at the house like it was no, no big deal to going to the emergency room to get it taken care of. But the problem would be if we treated the emergency like it was something regular. When you know something is under attack, it changes your whole 
posture. You're not careless anymore. So what are some ways that you might know that you're a little careless with your faith? Never showing up to worship with God's people. Not keeping up with relationships, people who are in your life who can check on you. Hiding our sin. You know how we, sometimes we'll have some sin we're struggling with that we don't want nobody else to know about, and we like to hide it in the corner in the darkness where nobody else can see it because we think we're protecting ourselves when really we're putting ourselves in danger. Not reading the Word at all, just, just kind of coasting. Not praying. I mean, there's so many ways we can be careless with our faith. And, I, and I'm not trying to call you to be afraid and fearful. I'm just calling you to be careful. I'm not saying retreat. I'm saying watch out because the danger is real. But, but God has said that he'll keep those who are his. Like, he'll hold on to us. But, but he's told us some ways that we need to hold on to him. I want to look at verse 6. This, this is what Paul says. So he said, I sent Timothy to check. Here's what Timothy found out. But Timothy has just now come to us from you. He's brought good news about your faith and love. He told us that you always have pleasant memories of us, that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you were standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. I know these are a lot of verses. Stick with me. Timothy brings back a good report. They're doing good, right? They're doing well. They, they have fine memories. So people are trying to convince them that Paul and them were lying to them. They, they remember what's going on. And he says, verse 8, we, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Before that, he was saying, we didn't want you to be unsettled by trials. There's a big difference between being unsettled by trials and standing firm in the Lord. Um, it's kind of like the terminal trains at the airports. Where, you know, before it moves, it always says, this train is about to move. Hold on. And it's always somebody who don't hold on, who just looking at their phone, and the train goes, and then they go. And I never feel bad for them because I'm like, they told you to hold on, bro. So before it goes, I just kind of look around like, who about to fall? Y'all should probably pray for me. That's not nice. Uh, <laughs> saying it out loud, it didn't sound very nice. But, but it's the same way, and, and the God is saying, look, this world is difficult. There's threats for us to be unsettled. He's saying, hold on. And, and the way that we hold on, we hold on to God. We hold on to his people. We hold on to the stuff he's given us for our faith to be able to persevere. God's voice, God's people are telling you to hold on. And, and he says he wants to see them face to face to complete what is lacking in their faith. Again, the implication is something is lacking in their faith. Their faith needs to mature and grow. Um, and so uh, I, he's not saying there's something lacking from their faith for them to be saved, but he's saying that, that there's some maturity that needs to occur, right? So I just want to remind you that what saves you is not the power or perfection of your faith. It's not just because you believe a lot. I want you to know that faith itself is not even a virtue. What saves you is not faith. What saves you is Jesus. Faith is not good unless you believe in something worth believing in. What, what saves us is Jesus. The object of our faith is what saves us. That faith needs to grow and mature. Jesus is a great Savior, and so we want our faith to be in good shape. We know it's in good shape when it's thriving and growing and standing firm and holding on. Just before I go to this next point, I just want to ask you how often you check in on other people. How often do you ask somebody else, how's your faith? Because the Scripture seems to say that our responsibility isn't just our own growth, but one another, right? And I also want to say this, how often do you let other people ask you how your faith is? Because some of us, if someone sends you a text saying, how's your faith, you're going to be like, how's your faith? What you, what you mean, how's my faith? I'm good, but how are you? I seen your Instagram, who is that? You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to do all of that. But, but we want our lives to be open and vulnerable enough that we can check in on each other and we care enough to check in on each other. So number one, right, your faith needs work. Just because we believe doesn't mean we've arrived. And, and the, the last point is this, you need God to work. You need God to work. Because your faith needs work, but you cannot do that work on your own. I do not want you to hear me saying 
that we play some part in saving ourselves. Our faith needs work, but, but what we don't do is just kind of assemble our faith to some perfect level and then just present it to God. God is behind all of it. I'll give you an example. I know I talk about my wife and my kids a lot. It's because I like them. But here's the example. My son, my son, he's loved Legos as long as he could. And he, um, you know, when he was younger, he, he liked Legos. He just wasn't good enough with them to do anything. And so, you know, we would build stuff together, which really meant I would build it and I would let him put his finger on it and I would press it down, that kind of thing. And so there was sometimes he wanted to hurry up and do it. And, and I just wasn't, I was doing something. And he'd be like, Dad, can I just do it by myself? I was like, I don't think it's going to turn out the same. He was feeling himself. I was, I, he's, I was like, I don't know. He's like, no, nah, can I just do it? I was like, oh, okay, go ahead. And so, you know, it was a Batmobile, and he came back, and, you know, it looked like a bunch of black bricks stuffed on top of each other. It did not look anything like the Batmobile. And, and here's the thing. He, he started to feel good about it, and he thought he could go and do it by himself. And this is what we do with God, where we say, oh, I think I'm at a point where I can go put my whole situation together and present it back to God, not understanding that it's really God who was putting this thing together, that he just graciously included you in the process of your growth. You, I mean, how foolish and proud can we be? to think that we need Jesus to save our souls, and then we could just take it from there. I can sanctify myself. I can grow myself. I can make myself more holy. You cannot. We're still dependent on God for that. We need God to work. That kind of I got this mentality may seem like it works in other areas of our life. It does not work with our pursuit of God. Listen to verse 11. He says this, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone just as we do for you. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. This is a a prayer for them, right? So he's praying God will allow them to go visit them. Then he asked that God would cause them to increase and overflow with love for one another, right? That God would cause them, right? God is the one working this within them. And I want you to know that um, he's not just talking about their faith, right? Overflow also with the love for one another. I want you to know that faith is always side by side with love. It's almost like faith and love are best friends who are inseparable. Whenever you see one, you see the other. Right, God, the, the greatest commandment is to love God and to love neighbor. So Paul is saying he's praying they'll overflow with that. Jesus is, is always the main example we have of love in Scripture, and we, and we want to look more and more like him. So sometimes when we begin to gauge even our own maturity as disciples, what our faith looks like, we'll just look to particular activities like, oh, did I go to this and did I read this? But we rarely really look in our lives for love. Sometimes the questions you need to ask yourself to see whether or not you, you're growing and, and how you're doing with Jesus isn't just do I show up in a building sometimes, it's do I actually love my neighbor? Do I actually love my brothers and sisters? Do I seem to even be growing in affection for God? Right? Is God at work in my life in that way? Faith and love are always side by side. Your love for God shows up in a way that you love others. And then the third thing he prays is this. May he make your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Blameless in holiness. Would anybody, when they're just putting in, you know, like their dating profile on some dating app, be like, how would you describe yourself? They'd be like, uh, short, uh, blameless in holiness, right? No one would do that because that's a high standard. Blameless in holiness means there is no fault to be found in you. There's, there's nothing you can be blamed for. He's talking about a perfect holiness. You know, it's one thing for us to, to seem blameless in holiness before our friends, or our coworkers, but he's saying, may God make us blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of Jesus. That is a high standard. We're talking about the God in the universe who knows everything about you, who knows what you're thinking right now, who knows um, your thoughts, your actions, your past, the stuff you feel like you can hide from other people. And he's saying that Jesus is going to make us blameless and holiness before him. Again, if, if you have tricked yourself into thinking that you can do this on your own, I'm just not sure how. God has to do this work in us. 
I wonder if you ever think about your, your, your faith in light of the second coming of Jesus, that, that Jesus is coming back. And, and the only way that we have this eternal joy to look forward to is if we're blameless in holiness before him. But the good news is our future, that, that future, us being blameless in holiness before God, is secured by what Jesus has already done in the past. Right, that you're not trying to come up with some new strategy and plan to get yourself to perfect holiness and blameless. You, you need to do what God has commanded you and it'll grow you in your faith. But at the end of the day, our confidence is in the work of Jesus. Our confidence is in the power of Jesus. So that some of us, it's hard for us to look forward uh, to have joy because all we see is the ways that we fall short and we see our flaws and we see our failures. But I want to encourage you not to base your confidence mainly on yourself but in Jesus. When the Bible talks about our boast being in Jesus, our glory being in Jesus, our confidence being in Jesus, it's in part having to do with this. Jesus is going to work this in you, right, that, that he can finish the work that he begun in you blameless in holiness. If you're here today um, and you know Jesus, I want to encourage you not to let your current sin overshadow the power and promises of God. Don't let the fact that you're weak doubt the strength, make you doubt the strength of Jesus. Just because you're weak doesn't mean that Jesus is. And I promise you Jesus can do this work in your life and he's promised to. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, I want to ask you whether or not you think that you can live a life that is blameless in holiness before God. Do you think that when the judge of the universe, you stand before him and he, and, and he knows everything about you, do you think that you would come off as blameless in holiness? That's a really high standard, one that we cannot meet. There's plenty of stuff that we should be blamed for. Even when we try, there's ways we want to do better, but we find ourselves falling short. We try and fail. You know, we, we try to uh, uh, do better on our mistakes, but we know we can't. Even if we could from this point forward live perfect, we can't go back in time and erase our mistakes. But I want you to know you can have hope that you will be blameless in holiness before God before Jesus himself. You, you might say, I'm guilty of making a lot of mistakes. I want you to know Jesus says, I can make you blameless. You might say, oh, I, but I've made a lot of people hurt, but Jesus says, I can make you blameless. You might say, I'm guilty of lies. Jesus says, I can make you blameless. You might say, I'm guilty of lust. Jesus says, I can make you blameless. You might say, I'm guilty of bitterness. Jesus says, I can make you blameless. You might say, I'm guilty of unforgiveness. Jesus says, I can make you blameless. Put whatever you want to at the beginning of that sentence. I want you to know at the end is this Jesus can make you blameless. And not based on what you can do, but what he's already done, that Jesus on the cross paid for our sins. And, and so if you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you to begin this journey that begins with faith in Jesus and the perfect life he's already lived on our behalf. If you don't know him, I want to encourage you to talk to some folks tonight about what it means to know Jesus. So we're always asking that question, then, are we there yet when it comes to our faith in Jesus? And, and I would say this, no, we're not there yet, but we will be, right? We will reach the end, and it'll be by God's power and God's strength. And the anticipation, knowing what Jesus is going to do in us, knowing what Jesus desires, knowing what Jesus paid for, should be part of what fuels our obedience. We should be excited about the opportunity to obey Jesus, knowing that we're getting a little foretaste of who God saved us to be. I don't want holiness to feel like a burden to you. I want it to feel like an opportunity, a goal, something that God has in mind for you, a beautiful dream and vision that you get to be who God called you to be. I don't want you to feel like you'd be throwing away your years while you're young by being holy and being obedient to Jesus. Instead, you'll be throwing away your years if you don't pursue holiness and obedience to Jesus. I want you to be who God created you to be right now, and God has invited us and given us the chance to do that. Just because you believe doesn't mean you've arrived, but by the power of Jesus, you can. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for Jesus. God, we know that the only solid hope 
we have is Jesus. God, we know that our only boast is Jesus, our only glory is Jesus. So, Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. Father, I pray for my friends here tonight who, who don't know Jesus, Lord, that you would help them to see him in a way they've never seen him before. God, that they would see him as a gracious, loving, kind, powerful Savior. Father, I pray if there's hesitation for what it means to let things go that we love to follow Jesus, God, you'd show us that Jesus is far greater. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in there who do know Jesus, Father, that you would help the, the power of Jesus to, to be shown as stronger than our own weakness, God. Father, give us the grace to love each other enough to help each other to grow in our faith. And Father, we pray that you would be honored in our lives. Thank you so much for Watermark. Thank you so much for the porch, Father. We pray you continue to work in them, Father. We pray you continue to glorify yourself in them. And God, we pray that we care for these folks well. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You guys can stay standing for a second. I, um, man, what a treat, dude. It was awesome. So encouraging. I, um, I, I, I don't know if it's, it's just women in general or I just have the same coincidental thing that I, I also married a serial plant killer. <clears throat> and as I was listening to that story and I was thinking about um, just the truth of just that idea of the fake plant, I couldn't help but think that there are some of you in the room that you think you have a living faith. And just like... You could go into someone's house and you see a plant and you're like, is that real or is it not? It, you get a little closer and you see it and you're like, oh, that's a fake plant. Some of you, and I, I hope you hear this with as gentle of a way as I can say it and as loving as I can say it, you think you have a real faith and you have a fake faith. And the reason it stays the same, just like year after year after year, if you see a fake plant, it never changes. It's not growing. It's not changing at all. The reason that your faith you're not seeing any growth and any change inside of it because you don't have a real faith. And maybe that's because you never actually accepted the free gift that God offers you. Maybe it's because you just grew up in church. Some of you, honestly, you've given up on the church and you've given up on Jesus and you grew up in the church and you grew up and you're like, I've been there, I went to youth camp and I tried all the things, those things. And then, you know, it just didn't work. And so you walked away and you walked into the world and you step back into places like, this, places like this tonight. And there's scars in your back, rear view mirror. And you hear messages like this, and you're like, dude, I, I feel like I've tried it before and it didn't work. And the truth is, you never tried it to begin with. You never accepted that free gift that God offers. Because it's not just a one-time thing, it's a relationship day after day after day. Let me be abundantly clear. You are not saved by anything that you do. You are saved by, in a moment, placing your faith in the object of Jesus, the Savior of the world, and his death and resurrection on a cross. That is what saves us, and that gives us access to have a relationship going forward and to have a living faith. But some of you need to hear me clearly, as lovingly as I can say it. You do not have a real faith. You have a fake faith. And the problem is not... Jesus, and it's not the church, and it's not Christianity, it's that you've never tried those things. And you've never stepped into the relationship that God wants you to experience day after day. Not because he's angry or disappointed or anything other than crazy in love with you. And tonight is your night, man. And the God of the universe brought an incredibly gifted friend and co-laborer in Christ to come and share that message to you because he didn't want you to wake up and spend another day without experiencing a real, living, growing faith. So if that's you inside of this room, there's gonna be a team of volunteers that'll be down front here right after the message. We would love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. There'll be volunteers that are wearing shirts just like this all throughout the lobby. I had to make sure that I'm wearing this shirt right now. All throughout the lobby that would love to talk with you. If you're just walking through a season where you're walking through the valley of the shadow of job loss or heartbreak or a loved one dying, and we can just pray with you. 
answer questions you maybe have. Maybe you're just wrestling with, you know, who is Jesus in general. Anything we can do to serve you. If you want to just know what the best tacos in town, we'd love to talk to you. Anything that we can do to provide for you, we'll have men and women that will be down here and spread all throughout that love to connect with you. In addition to that, there's something called First Step where if you are interested in making this place that can feel so big, I and mean, we know that you walk in here and it feels like overwhelming and it seems like everyone knows each other and they've all got the secret handshake down. It's just, just not the case. Our heart is to make this place that feels big feel really, really small and help you get connected with other people who you are checking in on, just like he said, and who can check in on you. And so one of the ways that we do that is every uh, month or so, we offer something called First Step. If you wanna take the first step and get it connected here, you can go right outside of these doors right here and you can get plugged into or get, uh, be a part of something called First Step of finding out what it looks like to take your first step and get plugged in here, answer questions, hear some of the vision and values of Watermark. In addition to that, we are so uh, just grateful for Tripp being here. He will also be joining us at Awaken and uh, hope that you will be joining us there as well, uh, there are limited, there already been thousands of tickets sold. And so we want everyone in this room and really everyone who wants to be there to be there. And so I would take advantage of that opportunity and go to awaken.life. Can we give it up one more time for our friend Trip, and all of Concord. And that is it. We love you guys so much. Go in peace, love and serve the Lord this week.